Uh, yeah, let's kick it off. Um, you know, Greg, thank you for joining and bringing a presentation to the table that hasn't been done before. You know, we've stayed connected, I'd say, for several years, and I've and I've observed what you've been able to do for the industry and the impact that you have on contractors. And also from different lenses, different perspectives, you know, you've been on all sides of it, right? And you can speak on behalf of building owners, on behalf of contractors, just really, I appreciate what you've done pushing forward the industry. So I was at uh, the last convention and, and I ran into Greg and we were talking about doing a webinar and he floated some ideas around, um, but I really wanted to put this together and bring him in. And he came up with this, you know, service isn't what you think it is. He'll talk to that and also do a better job explaining who he is and who he's from and where he's from. But this is going to be a different perspective. And I want everyone that's in this webinar to think of pieces as it relates to their business from a different perspective. You know, we want everyone to be able to take something from this and grow and learn and, 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 and do better. So Greg, without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Uh, I can see your screen. You are good to go. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I've been looking forward to this. Um, it's interesting. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, I have been a commercial roofing consultant for well over 20 years now. I no longer have any building owner customers, but I'm still a roof consultant. But I used to work with, I've been privileged to work with some tremendous high quality um, organizations that, that own buildings. And one of the things I've learned by being a roof consultant is what those owners want and need. And so what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is um, some of the things I've learned. I've also been a roofing contractor. There's not a problem that you have that I cannot appreciate. I don't know that I've had all of them, but I've had more than my fair share. And then as a consultant, I have a perspective also, because a lot of times building owners are knowledgeable about what they want the end result to be, but they really don't know how to get there. And so I can help them with that. I can help you with that. Um, when we get toward the end, when we get ready for questions, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what all I do. Um, but I want to jump into this. Now, what this is different. Than, so this, the title of this is services and what you think it is. For the, If any of you have heard me before, you're going to hear some things that are familiar. And that's because my messaging doesn't change because what you need to know doesn't change. Um, but I have put this together a little differently. And what I have done differently this time is I have intentionally made this presentation shorter than I sometimes do. And the reason for that is one of the things I've observed is that oftentimes when um, I'm at the IRE and I'm listening to a presentation, they they blast you with so much information that you sometimes have trouble understanding what's important, what's less important, and what's really not all that important. That's not going to happen today. I have a message for you, and I'm going to make sure you understand very clearly what it is. And there's going to be plenty of time for questions. And some of the things I've put in the presentation are designed to elicit questions. So when we get to the question and answer period, I want to help. So having said all of that and prefaced that, service isn't what you think it is. <clears throat> I want to talk with you about Randy, your competitor. So... In my role as roof consultant, I used to have 35 shopping centers that I took care of in Florida alone for one client. And there was, an, for this particular organization, they got a new VP and he went out and did a bunch of property inspections. And I got a call from the local property manager saying, hey, Greg, the new VP's been out. We've been at such and such a shopping center. They've looked at the Spanish tile mansard across the front of the shopping center. It's looking kind of tired. We're thinking that we may want to paint it, but we at least want to get it clean. Can you help with that? I said, sure. I said, we're not going to get a painter out there because he'll tromp on all that tile and break half of it. I'm going to have our roof room. Well, we don't care. So I called Randy on a Monday. 
I said, Randy, and I gave him the name of the shopping center when he knew it. And, and I said, give me a price to power wash the tile and then assume that they're going to walk out there and look at it. And they're going to think about it for five months before they decide what they're going to do. And then they'll probably have you paint it, but you'll have some touch up. Got it. He's fine. And then I did something with Randy at that point that I do not do with any other contractor I've ever worked with. I hung up the phone because I knew what was going to happen. With every other contractor I work with, including some very, very high profile good ones, before I hang up the phone, I always ask a question. When am I going to get the quote? I didn't need to do that with Randy because I knew what was going to happen. On Wednesday, two days later, here comes a quote from Randy saying, Dear Greg, here is the quote for power washing at the shopping center. Now listen to what else he said in the next paragraph. I have decided that I want to meet the Sherwin-Williams rep out there to make sure that we use the right kind of paint because we don't do this every day and I want to make sure I have it right. And at that point, I typed these words, Randy, thanks, click. On Friday, I got another email from Randy saying, Greg, I'm going to be out there with Sherwin-Williams on Tuesday. Randy, comma, thanks, click. On Tuesday, I get an email from Randy saying, have met Sherwin-Williams, you'll have the price tomorrow. Thanks, click. And on Wednesday, I get an email from Randy says, Greg, I need to apologize to you for taking so long to get you this quote. Here's the quote for the painting. Now, at this point, I really had a lot of work to do. I said, Randy, this is really no problem. Thanks, click. Now, what would it be like for all of you, for you to do your job and do it well, is all you have to do is sit around all day going, thanks, click, because that's what Randy did for me. And that's what you need to do for your customers. <laughs> Dave, same company. In 2008, when the economy crashed, my client, same client, had a shopping center coming out of the ground in Fort Lauderdale. They had the construction loan. They had the footers poured. They had to build it. So they built it. So they built this big shopping center. They had no tenants. And they sent me to do a a final inspection, and it was eerie being on these roofs because there was nothing there. There was no mechanical equipment on any of the roofs, which was a problem, which we addressed because of condensation inside in Florida. But I walked the roofs and gave them my report. And one of the things I noticed is at the front of the shopping center, now this is in Fort Lauderdale where there are wind codes. The front of the shopping center was uh, fabricated from uh, C channel metal studs. And they went up like 10 feet high at the front parapet. This is to make it look really impressive. Okay. And they've got EFAS on the outside and some sort of panel on the on the backside in a wind zone. Well, this is a great big sail up there. So the architect had designed a structural support. He had some kicker beams. These were six by six tubes or uh, square tubes that were coming out of the back of the, the wall and they were going down into the metal deck and they went right down in. And they went down at an angle such that it was in the judgment of the roofing contractor and I kind of agreed, probably impossible to do a good job of field flashing them because of the tight angles. And so he put pitch pans around. There were over a hundred of them, which I noted. So, a year or so later, they're starting to lease things up, and <clears throat> we're starting to have some leaks, and the leaks were some of these pitch pans. And so I called the contractor that installed it, and I said, because it's within the two-year period, and I said to him, I said, hey, what up? Pitch pans. They said, it's inside the pitch pan. It's considered a maintenance item. And it's not part of the warranty, and we're not obligated to fix it. That'll be $350 for each of those we fix. Error. Meanwhile, in one of the outbuildings, a Chinese restaurant moved in. Now, you all understand service, and you've probably heard the old expression, if you want to ruin a roof, put in a restaurant. 
And the special cases, if you want to ruin it faster, put in a Chinese restaurant, well, that's what they did. And and so the, the Chinese restaurant owner had hired his own contractor to come out and do all the flashing work to the roof. And he actually used TPO, but he set all the flashing in NP1, in caulk. Didn't weld any of it. So we have leaks. So I get a call from the roofer. The roofer says, blah, 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 blah. I'm going, uh, give me a price to fix it. So he gave me a price to fix it. It was like $4,500 to reflash, clean up the mess and reflash the curves. We ordered, ordered it. And then we waited and we waited and we waited for the invoice. And then the property manager starts bugging me. He said, Greg, where's the invoice for this? He said, there's a whole bunch of other stuff they screwed up and I want to send them a bill. I need a price from the roofer. I need this bill. So I called the roofer on the phone. I said, where's the bill? They said, we don't know. I said, here's a copy of your quote. Send me a bill for this amount of money. It still took them two weeks to do that. My property manager is losing his mind saying, I, what? I can't deal with this. Is there any way we can use another contractor? And I said, well, it so happens we're out of the two-year warranty just last week. So yes. And I said, I can call someone else. I said, I can call somebody that works with Randy. He said, what's his name? I said, his name is Dave. He said, do it. So I called Dave. <coughs> so all of a sudden, all of our problems went away. And then I, I get a phone call one day from Dave. And Dave is saying to me, Greg, you know, you got all these pitch pans at this shopping center. And he said, some of them are leaking. He said, yes, I know they're leaking. And the manufacturer won't stand behind it. He said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. He said, I tore one of them apart. They cheated. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, first of all, he said, they didn't prime the pipe. And there's no way you would know that because they painted it after they installed it. The pitch pan is too shallow. It needed to be deeper and they need to be using a two part, not a one part. There's no chance that this would work. Now, listen to what he said to me. He said, this is BS, except he didn't say BS. Okay. He said, I am going to call, and he gave me the name of the manufacturer. He said, I'm going to call him on the phone. I'm going to get his body part. You can guess what part I'm talking about. I'm going to drag his mm -hmm out and get him up here, and I'm going to make him fix this. And I said, Dave, thanks. Two weeks later, there was a meeting out there, and Dave beat up the rep got him to admit it was wrong. And they agreed that every time we had a leak, they would let them go fix it and bill them. There's over a hundred of these. They saved my client $35,000 in repairs. Do you think when we do a little preventive maintenance on this roof that, and I, and I give my, my, my uh, owner a bill or a, a quote for $7,500 for some preventive maintenance. Do you think he says to me, Greg, you think we could get that done by somebody else for $6,900? Heck no. They want him to be doing the work. Because Dave makes my life easy and he makes my owner's life easy. That is great service. Repair and maintenance is what you do to a roof. Service is what you give to a customer. And service has nothing to do with roofing. And as long as you think it does, you're going to struggle. Service is entirely about communication. Great communication is first and foremost about urgency. How many of you send out letters of apology to a customer when it takes eight days to get them a quote? When it takes you eight days to give a quote? Randy was embarrassed because their basic policy is you call on a Monday, you need it by Friday. And he makes good on that, or I get a letter of apology. And some of you, at least some of you are in Florida, you have to compete against these people. 
So you need massive urgency around all communication. Now let's talk about what this means. And there's a second piece. Part of there's a special thing here. And the second piece is that documentation is a form of communication. Okay. Today is Wednesday. And tomorrow you drop your truck off at the car dealer to get the oil changed and the tires rotated. Uh, you do it in the morning. And at about two o'clock in the afternoon, you get a call from the, the, the service place. They say, we have your truck taken care of. Tires are rotated. We checked the brakes. They're fine. We got the oil changed. We've topped up your fluid. We think that we'll have the bill added up for you on Monday. But we're not sure. Why don't you come by on Tuesday to pick up your truck? Now, when I do this at a trade show where I can actually see the roofers, they're all sitting there laughing. Like, you got to be kidding. I'm not about to. There's no way in hell I'm going to wait for my truck until next week. I expect to be able to pick it up today. How long does it take for you to get your invoices out? after a repair because a knowledgeable building owner understands that it is also a communication document and he wants to know what you did now not three days from now see you want this too you want urgency everything i'm telling you today you want if you're on the other side of the service equation there's nothing that I'm going to be talking to you about that you don't already want. So on a communication, there's different kinds of urgency. The first is you need to respond to all voicemails within 20 minutes. If you can't, it's okay because you're going to have a voice record. You're going to have a voicemail message on there saying, hi, this is Greg Hain of Hain Coaching Group. I'm out of the office. While I'm out, there's going to be delays in my ability to respond. Please leave a message. I will get back to you as soon as I can, which is a communication. You need to reply to all emails when you read them. If you have time to read it, you have time to reply. The reply may be, I don't know, but I'll find out by the end of the day and let you know. It may be, I have no idea. I'll let you know by tomorrow noon. But if you have time to read it, you have time to reply. Invoices for leak repairs should be in the hands of the owner within 24 hours of the time that you walk off the roof, preferably the same day. I, as roof consultant, have worked with contractors where if the roofer is off the roof at 10 o'clock in the morning, by noon, I've got the invoice. And that means he's emailed it to the customer and the customer is emailed it to me because I used to review all the invoices. An invoice is a communication document. And the great thing about CenterPoint is technically you have the ability to send the invoice the instant you walk off the roof. Now, that may not be a good idea, but we're going to come back to that. All quotes for service proposals need to be out within five days. If they call you on a Monday, they need it by Friday. If your closing ratio on those proposals is less than 50%, you're doing something wrong. And probably one of the things you're doing wrong is taking too long to get it to them. Because if it takes you two weeks to get them to quote, it probably arranged three times. It didn't leak at all, and they say, I don't need to do this, it didn't leak, and they throw it away. That's how you have closing ratios of 20%. On documentation, you need to provide appropriate before and after pictures. So these pictures are as close to perfect as you can get you have two before pictures, one up close, one far away. 
you have two after pictures, which you'll notice are taken from almost exactly the same place as the before pictures. One up close and one far away. If, some, if you've got people that are taking 42 pictures of everything, that's sloppy. Okay, four pictures. Now, why do we want to take the pictures up close? So that you can see the problem. Why do we want to take the pictures from far away? So that we have an idea of where this is located on the roof. And as you can see in the, uh, the far away pictures, you can see in the background a roof hatch. It's by a mechanical unit. Everything you need to be able to find it. This documentation, those four photos, is fantastic. If you do more than that, it's noise that just confuses people, and it reflects poor training. Now, I'm going to tell you a little more. The annotations here are poor. Why? Now, I'm not expecting you to answer me, but I'm going to pause for a second to give you a chance to I'll read these. Pitch pockets hold water or has it deteriorated. Shrinkage of the filler is causing water uh, to enter. Replacement may be needed due to age and deterioration. And down at the bottom, it says, if pitch pan is in salvageable, salvageable condition, additional filler material may be needed. There are several options for replacement, possibly eliminating the pitch pan and using a three-course flashing material. That annotation is horrible. What it should say for the before pictures are pitch pan is leaking. What it should say for the after picture is pitch pan repaired per industry standards. Under no circumstances do you want to speculate as to why this happened. Or how it happened. This is leaking. We fixed it. That's all you want to say on leaks. When you give them multiple choice, you confuse them. I know a contractor who picked up $750,000 worth of service work in one year from two different contractors who had language in their annotations of their photos that confused the owners. And the owner says, well, why don't they just say that? I don't like this. Find me somebody else. Now, I've talked about all this, and there's a problem in all of this. When you think about what you need to do to get your invoices out within 24 hours, when you think about what you need to do to get all of your quotes for service proposals out within five uh, working days, you all are going to go into panic mode. And the reason for that is because the crews that you have are not properly trained. I say this is a problem, except it really isn't a problem. Let me explain. You have a, a 100,000 square foot TPO recover to do. Now, I realize I'm talking to service people, but... You've got a nice go and flow job to do. You're going to put down a half inch HD ISO board and you're going to rhino bond 60 mil TPO over the top of it. It's go and flow. Nothing's wet. You don't have to cut anything out. Not a lot of penetrations. Yeah. Um, I don't know what region of the country all of you are in, but let's just assume that properly installed this roof is going to take 30,000 fasteners. Now, when I am at a trade show like the IRE doing this, I say to the roofers, if it's there, how many fasteners do you want them to install? And they kind of screw up their face. And you know what they tell me? 30,000. I said, well, well, wait a minute. 30,000 fasteners. Okay. You know, I think it'd be okay if they only installed 28,500. That'd be 95% of them. Would that be okay? And they all say no. Hmm. I said, when they put these screws in, is it okay if they leave them, some of them like a, ah, three quarters of an inch above the top of the roof? And they're sitting there chuckling. Okay. 
Or, okay, so you want them all screwed down. So after they screwed them down, it's okay if they just hold the trigger for a while until those suckers spin. Again, that's not okay. I find that interesting. So, okay, we get the roof put on, and apparently we put in all 30,000 fasteners, and we put them into the right depth. And, okay, good. And the inspector goes up there. He pulls out his probe, and he puts it down. On, oh, oh, that's that's a cold weld. He's oh, more cold weld. Oh, there's cold welds everywhere. You're going to have to strip in the whole roof. Well, that's going to burn, isn't it? I have a question for you. You have another 100,000 square foot job to start next week. Are you just going to take that crew and just trot them into their trucks and send them down there and say, go get started on it? Or is there going to be a conversation? And what I can't speak for all of you, but I can tell you what they tell me from the, when I'm talking to the people at the IRE or, or the FRSA or Western States, what they say to me is there's going to be a conversation, maybe some retraining. Okay. And then I say to them, well, what happens if they do it again? He said, they're gone. And I said, yeah, but good crews are hard to find. And they said, if they can't get this right, they're not a good crew and I can't afford to have. I see. Well, here's the thing about service. Not putting in all the fasteners is not taking all the pictures. Leaving the screws up or spinning them or a bunch of cold welds. That is doing a poor job of documentation. It is exactly the same thing. But service people tell me, well, good crews are hard to find. Yeah, but on the production side, you won't tolerate it. Why do you tolerate it on, this, on the service side? The reality is most of you tolerate this, and there's no reason to tolerate this. You need to train them. And I'm not going to teach you a lot about training them today. If Will wants to invite me back, we can do a whole thing on how to properly document. But you need to train them. But if they still don't do it right, you got to get rid of them because they're no good. It's exactly the same thing. So the reason we always get 30,000 fasteners on, on the production side is because we got a manufacturer that's going to come up and check. If we had the same standards on the service side, the quality of everything would go up. And that's what you need to do. So I understand the problem is your crews aren't well trained and they can't take good pictures and you got to fix everything before you send it to an owner. That's on you until you have them properly trained. And after you have them properly trained and they're and if they if they just don't care, you got to get rid of them. You will never build a great service department with substandard workmanship. And documentation is every bit as important as can they find and fix the leak. As a roof consultant, I have had to fire very few contractors in my career because they couldn't find the leak. I have fired lots of contractors because they couldn't communicate. They couldn't tell me what they did. They couldn't tell me where they did it. They couldn't tell me in a timely way. It is all about communication. You train, they perform, or they're gone. It really is this easy or simple. Not easy. It's simple. It's not hard to understand. The urgency is not simply about getting out and fixing the leak after a rain. It's about everything that happens afterwards. That is my message. Now, before we get to the questions, and I do want to take your questions. Um, if I, I train roofing contractor service departments. I know many of you know that. I've been doing it for over 15 years. And um, I will be more than glad with any of you to set aside an hour. Just go to Greg at Hain Coaching Group and send an email, or you can just log in at Hain Coaching Group there in the bottom right. And there's places where you can click and you can have access to my schedule and I'll be glad. And I will try to help you. And um, in most cases, when people try to hire me, I, I say no, because I know they're not ready because I am not interested in taking your money if I can't give you the results that you need. Um, we have a podcast that we do. 
that's called pants around ankles prevention. None of you like to be standing there and say, how did this happen to me? Because you're standing there with your pants around your ankles. So we have a podcast that we do that is about preventing that. And you're welcome to subscribe to that. Um, there's the little icon. And yes, that's my legs. Okay. But back here, it's but it's time for questions. So uh, what do we have so far? Yeah, start loading them in, guys. Um, you know, and, and I would encourage you to think through different perspectives when you're asking these questions. These could be training related, these could be, you know, process related, these could be technical related. Any any questions about any aspect of service, I'll be glad to anything that has to do with service. So the, the about first this. one that we got is a, is a 48 hour window to provide an estimate or tone set up, I don't know what they mean, or to set up an inspection, a good window for a client. So is a 48 hour window to provide an estimate or to do an inspection, a good window for a client? I think I think 48 hour window to set up an inspection is perfectly okay. Um, I think to turn that around and get the estimate into his hands within that same 48 hour window is probably very doable on many occasions, but not always. So let's understand when I'm talking about, if somebody calls you on Monday, you need to have them the quote by Friday. This is not, if it is a hospital system with, um, 42 roofs on three buildings, no. This is this thing where you've got one building you're going out there where there's one roof or maybe a little office roof on the front or something like that, where they can go up and they can do the inspection they need to do in a half a day or less. It's the kind of stuff that's the bread and butter of service. That's the stuff you need to be able to do quickly. Um, but if you're going to do this within 48 hours, I'm wondering who's going to be doing this. Because if you're using an estimator, he, he, he may have estimates he needs to get done. Um, it may be raining like a holy terror for the next two days. So when you set these goals, you have to have some realistic expectations about the reality of the world in which we work. And... Um, but do I think 48 hours is reasonable? Yeah. Now, I'm of the opinion, if it's, if it's for quoted work, I'm of the opinion that if someone calls in a roof leak, you should immediately put it on the schedule. Mm -hmm. Ideally, immediately it should go on the schedule. That doesn't mean it gets assigned to a crew, but it should go on the schedule. Now, I, I don't know how Centerpoint handles that because some sometimes when you put it on the schedule, it immediately gets assigned. I don't know how that works. In center point but ideally it's got to go on a calendar it cannot sit on a desk it's got to go on a calendar yeah agreed it goes into the queue too uh this is a kind of a two-prong question one's the technical response which i'll get you chris um but this this question is really more of a it's kind of process related too so we've noticed that it's helpful to have a photo of where the leak is located from inside the building it's especially handy for return trips, if the customer has another leak, having those interior photos helps them distinguish new leaks from repeat leaks. Yes, absolutely. Chris, I instruct you to, to store those ones in, the, in our file library, um, and you probably wouldn't want to put those, or you could include them on the invoice, but shoot us a separate note if that wasn't clear enough. That center uh, point uh, geo references photos, doesn't it? Yes. So um, I'm going to go back up. this picture okay so the reason we have far away pictures is because not all apps allow you to geo reference photos mm -hmm. and if you look at the first the before picture of the pitch pan and the after picture you kind of suspect it's going to an hvac unit but here's my question for you there's 16 hvac units on the roof which one is this yeah. You can't tell from those up close pictures. The purpose of the after pictures is to help locate it on the roof and the G and the, the geo referencing um, capability of center point helps you pinpoint that even better. 
Why is this important? Because when they're servicing that HVAC unit and they take the door off and they set it down and they punch a hole in the roof and you go out there to fix it. If this is at a shopping center, the tenant is responsible for the maintenance of the HVAC equipment, which means that the hole that got punched in the roof was done by his people and he should pay for that. And if we're looking at the left side of these uh, series of pictures, you have no idea where this was, but when you can show that them the hole and show that it's right by the unit, they can take your bill, they can send it to the property manager and say, this is recoverable from your tenant, and he can turn around and bill the tenant and collect your fee, making you free, which they like. That's called recovery. So now to speak to Will's point, do I think it's a good idea to take pictures on the inside? Absolutely, it's a good idea to take pictures on the inside. I mean, I think you need to have a property identification photo. I think you need to have pictures on the inside, but you got to have these four pictures before and after up close and far away. Yeah. The other thing that I think is, let's say you go up on a roof and somebody's put a new facade on the front of the building and it's a TPO roof. Well, the reason you're there is because they punched 25 holes in the roof when they're doing the facade work, okay? I don't think that you need to have before and after pictures for all 25 because you're gonna be giving them a report that's 200 pages long or whatever. No, they need clear understanding of the typical, not every single one. Will, have I addressed all aspects of the question? Yeah, certainly. And and I'm gonna to try to push a little bit because we've got a, a backlog of these. Um, okay. not to but, but you know this is a good one do, do you recommend sharing repair findings while the team is on site or do you wait till after it's been reviewed by management ah under no circumstances should the repair crew ever talk to the people that live under that roof because they always demonstrate that they say the wrong thing mm -hmm. okay um I think that it's fine for the repair techs to share their findings with the office saying, hey, there's a safety issue up here. I just walked across some deck that's really spongy. Okay, that's that we're making phone calls about that. Okay, because that's a safety issue. Um, but um any as a roof consultant, anytime a roofing contractor I sent out, walked down a ladder at a shopping center and talked to the tenant. I found out about it 10 minutes later because they inevitably say something to the tenant along the lines of, oh, the roof's a piece of shit. And yeah. then he goes in and calls the property manager and says, hey, your roofer told me my roof's up. Mm -hmm. And when am I going to get a new roof? And then I get a phone call saying, what did that idiot roofer do when he was out there? And that roofer's fired. So, I mean, that roofer is fired always when that happens. So you do not, and, and so you come down the ladder and somebody says, what'd you see? Well, we went out there to fix a leak. We found and we fixed the leak. Well, what was it? What caused it? So I understand that. And I have been told that if that we will be glad to help you understand that, please call our office. Okay. They deflect. And all of them want to talk they all want to show off how much they know, and all they do is make a problem for you. Less is more. What else do we have, Will? Uh, this is a good one. Uh, I'm curious what you would say to, to this, but what is the best course of action in training service technicians so they're versed in all roof systems? All? No. There's too many. So let's talk about... Um, the primary roof systems, EPM, TPO, modified bitumen, metal, some things like that. Um, the best way to train them is to have the manufacturer come do it. Call Carlisle, call Firestone, or I guess they call it Elevate now. Call mm -hmm. GAF, call the manufacturers and have them come and do the training. Those people will tell, teach you how to properly weld or how to properly glue or how, how to properly torch. They won't be all that good in helping you find the leak. Um, 
the best way to train people to find a leak is to pair them with somebody that knows how to find a leak. Make them a helper, send them out with a knowledgeable person. And by the way, the, the job of the foreman is always to train the helper so that a year from now, the helper can have his own truck. And yeah. most of them won't do that unless you make sure that you talk with them regularly. How's he doing? What's he good at? Are, and, and, and sometimes what you literally have to say is, he's going to do the welding. Oh, no, he can't do the welding. Then you get him trained because next week he's going to do all the welding. It's not hard to get this done. Your, serv your, your foremen are not going to want to train him. They're lazy. They don't care. Whatever. Okay, fine. Next week, he's going to do all of the patches. Get him trained. Okay. Did I answer that sufficiently? Yeah, I like it. You know, bring the manufacturer in, right? And pairing. You know, your knowledge it, it needs to be spread. Uh, the best way to do that is to, is to team them up. Um, Mark is asking: Are there tips to help motivate proper documentation besides sending your technicians? to our competitors. I, I, I don't understand. Say that again. Are there tips to help motivate proper documentation besides sending your technicians to our competitors? Not really sure what that means, but maybe you can just comment on tips to help motivate proper documentation for service techs, right? So they're yeah, yeah. So let's understand that motivation is cultural. Uh, there is a large proportion of our workforce that is Latino. Latinos do not like to be recognized above their peers. They like to be one of the crowd. Um, but one of the things that I suggest you do is you grade the documentation. Put together a little checklist and find a way to score uh, documentation when it comes in and you give everybody a grade. And I'm a big, fa big uh, fan of having a big flat screen uh, up in the ready room where you post the scores, the cumulative scores. Hmm. And so crew A has got 300 points. Crew B has got 752 points. And uh, why does he have more points than me? Well, here's why. And we pull out examples of what this guy is doing that you're not doing and vice versa. Okay. Now, in some in some areas of the country, Doing that is illegal. I think California is one of them. Right? So you got to know what you're allowed to do. Um, you can, some people are motivated by this and they give cash prizes. They walk into the ready room once a month with a big hot pile of cash and give him $400, give him $300. Oh, you don't get any. Why not? Because your documentation is poor. So those are things that sometimes work. Mm. But if you can't get them to do the pictures the way you want the pictures, you can tell, you can tell whether they're trying or not. They're not trying, get rid of them. Okay. If they're, if you would not put a guy on a production job who consistently could not weld properly, if they won't take the pictures because they're not trying and they don't care, you got to get rid of them. I like um, that. I saw something come in from David Daniel. I know David. So he's asking a great question here. What happens if you have an HVAC leak? What happens is the HVA tech is going to say the problem is the roof. And the roofer is going to say the problem is the HVAC tech. And yeah. then we have this. Okay. That's not good service. So what we used to do with the roofers that we worked with I would say, are you sure it's the unit? They go, oh yeah, it's the unit. Okay. HVAC people know to take the door off to see if the coils are frozen, to see if the condensate pan is, is frozen up. That's all they really know how to do. Okay. They don't know that water can get in other ways. So what you have to do, if you can, if you can prove that the problem is, here's what we would do. We would call the tenant on the phone and we would say to them, the problem you're having is with your unit. Now, your HVAC guy is going to say that it's the roof. But our roofer has been up there, and he knows it's the, it's the HVAC unit. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to send out our roofer. You're going to send out the HVAC guy. And the loser 
is going to pay both bills. If it turns out that it's the roof, we will pay your HVAC guy and we'll pay the roofer. If it turns out it's the HVAC guy, you're going to pay him and you're going to pay our roofer. And what I want you to know is we've never paid. Do you want to have your roof? You want to have your HV guy come back and try a little harder? Would you like for, if he wants to, he can call us on the phone and we can explain to him how the water is getting in. That's one of the things we do. Okay. Um, a video of the water test is a great idea, but I have seen, I have, one of my clients used to be Kroger and they have these great big HVAC units up on the roof and the, and the roof techs, the, the HVAC techs are Kroger employees and they treat these units like they're their children. And we reported to on a store that the, the unit's leaking. We water tested it. We put water on thing. Water came into the store just like that. The tech didn't believe it. So we took him out there and he watched the water test. He still didn't believe it. Hmm. Okay. He couldn't believe it was his unit. So there are times when people are difficult. Okay. What else do you have that you've got? Um, next one regarding uh, with, with Centerpoint, it allows us to offer multiple different repairs, i.e. emergency or proactive. Sometimes I find this causes confusion with customers. Do you recommend this? They want to hear about your thoughts on. Yeah. So items. I think here's what I see. I see that the person doing the evaluation does not know the difference between an emergency and a and a preventative repair. Emergency means it's leaking and water's getting inside the building. If that's not happening, it's not an emergency. Mm -hmm. If it is anything else, gosh, that, that, if we're looking at the picture of the pitch pan and we're seeing that if water's not getting in, it's not an emergency. Yes, that ought to be leaking. But apparently what's happening is the it's filling up and it's going in, it's going into the insulation, but it's not an emergency. Emergency, it leaks. That's the way I look at it. And here's what I see. I see a tendency by everybody to put together, um, oh, this is an emergency. Oh, this needs to be taken care of. This needs to be taken care of. And they end up with literally $35,000 worth of emergency repairs on a shopping center that's not leaking. Yeah. I've seen that. Okay. So the confusion comes in when, and I, I've been on a roof recently within the last two years where there was $12,000 of repairs, $10,000 of which were listed as emergency, $2,000 were, 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 were considered remedial or preventative. And the other reality is it was the other way around. Right. There was about $2,000 worth of stuff that really needed to be done. The other 10 stuff was if you want. Yeah. What else do we have in the way of questions? Uh, the center points separate between maintenance clients, top tier and lower tier clients for the crews when they're on the roof. That's more of a me question. Uh, so yes, Mark, we could show you that there's actually a flag. If there's um, a customer in your system and they have a service agreement, that flag is visible when you're scheduling that service, when you're putting it on the board uh, and throughout that process. So I'll push to the next one. Question, when quoting multiple repairs, and some take more time to get pricing, metal fabrication, special orders, et cetera. Would you recommend splitting the proposal slash inspection and or site bid? We call that a repair quote, depending on what the method is being used. A lot of times we are asked to wait until all information is in, but it makes the quote process longer to get it out the door. Okay. So let's talk first a little bit about estimating. I believe that if a repair is going to take less than two days, you do not need to have an estimator go look at it. You need to have the repair crew who's uh, who's hopefully identified it. This is just like an upsell kind of thing. Um, if you're doing an inspection, a paid inspection, and they, that's different. But for from an estimating standpoint, if you're sending an if you're making an estimator do all the estimates, that's not scalable. If it's going to be less than two days, if the repair crews are turning in upsell, and by the way, all of your repair crews should be turning in upsell opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, that's another training thing that you have to do. 
And the way you get them to do that is you give them one work order and they can't leave the roof until they call. And then you say, are there any upsell opportunities on the roof? And you make sure you get them before you give them another work order. So um, I think that when you have something where you've got roof issues and you've got metal and it's more complicated, the ideal thing you need to do is you need to talk to the owner and ask the owner what they want. And if the owner says, I want all of it at once, then that's what the owner gets. If the owner says, give me the roof part and then give me the, ask the, ask the owner and let the owner tell you because the customer can decide. That's fair. I like that. Um, Charlie's asking, best way for crews to track cost, material and man hours while out on the roof. We've had instances where crews run over anticipated hours on the roof and blow through the not to exceed. How can we leverage center points to help them know where their actual cost is at? Uh, Charlie, I can help you with that. Um, that's visibility to the crew. So some crews will have the ability to see estimate details and others won't or shouldn't. But I would put that in your estimate bar and make sure that the techs are set up as service foreman versus service technician because they can see and contribute to that estimate bar. But get with me and I'll hop on a call with you and, and walk through it if you want. Regarding the turnaround, are you first qualifying customers? I think this comment came in when you were talking about turnaround on turnaround time on quotes. Are these to qualified customers or do you use that across the board? That is a very good question. So um, I think that it's important to make an effort to qualify all unsolicited inbound leads to try to determine whether or not they're a fit for you. Now, if they're calling in and they're asking you to come do an inspection, the question is, do you do free inspections or do you do paid inspections? And I'm going to tell you if it is inbound, unsolicited, you're going to charge them. You don't need to charge them an arm and a leg, but you need to get into them. If they will not give you $300 to come do an inspection, they are not going to give you money. Um, if, if this is an existing customer, then it's all different. Um, if it's an existing customer that is a good customer, he pays on time, you know that if you give him a quote, you're gonna get the work. You, you're not gonna charge him for the inspection. You're gonna get the work. Um, you don't need to qualify that. Now, if he's a customer and he has a track record of running you around and making you wait 18 months before he finally, and he's a pain in the butt, then someone with some sales skills needs to take him through a qualification process to figure out what's really going on here before you decide how you address it. Now that's kind of vague, but the question was too, because there's no, there's no hard and fast, always do it this way or always do it that way, but it takes no talent to give away free inspections. Takes no talent to do that. Here's um another question. Um, how much time we got? Seven minutes? We good for seven more minutes? Yeah, I'm good for that. Okay. So in your opinion, keep the flow of communication between the service crew and the customer to have a, a service field supervisor that is designated to be that customer contact to explain issues for repairs. And follow up to that is, do you think it's important to have a dedicated service salesperson on staff to drive larger repairs? Great, great questions. So first of all, we don't let the repair crew talk to the uh, talk to the customers. Somebody else is going to have to talk to the customers. How many trucks do you have? Do you have two trucks? You don't need a sales staff. If you have twenty-two trucks, you need sales. So it kind of depends upon your organization. Um, I think that um, there are many, many communications that can be handled by a competent service coordinator. This is 
ge generically and stereotypically, the girl that answers the phone, that takes the incoming phone call and stuffs it in her center point. She knows how to do all of that, okay? And then if there's a question that comes in, she's gonna be the person that gets it. And she has a, has a chance of answering some of the questions. She's got some expertise, okay? She can often handle those things. Mm. Hey, we were out on the roof. And when we were out there, uh, we fixed this pitch pan for you and, and we're sending you the bill, it was $500. Now we found 10 more. And if you wait for each of them to leak at $500 a pop, it's gonna be $5,000. I'm gonna be sending you a quote later today for $3,500. And if you want, we can go up there and fix all 10 for the $3,500, save you $1,500 and keep them from leaking. Yeah, you're, you, your in-office service coordinator can do that. You don't need a fancy salesman to do that. Now, maybe they can't, but somebody needs to be able to do that. But it's probably not somebody that knows what roofing is. Because this is about customer service. It's not about roofing. And the people that are really good at roofing should not be talking to the customers. I mean, there's if you're at a plant and you're up on the roof, the maintenance man is trailing along behind you. He's going to be asking the crew questions. And th that kind of situation is different. But in the typical scenario, you do not want the crews, you do not want the service superintendents talking to the customers, ideally. Because they think it's about roofing. It's not about roofing. Not. What else? Yeah, you're right. Uh, earlier, you discussed not having repair crews speak to tenants. You're just talking about this now, you know, Right. Uh, however, we've had instances where these people have loved our foreman. Would you say it really comes down to training guys on service as having a customer service personality or just tactical training? So <clears throat> this is a great question. And yes, you're going to have techs that are really good with customers. However, virtually all of those techs are eventually going to find themselves in a situation where they are over their head and don't know it. And they will say the wrong thing. They may not, they may not say, oh, the roof is a piece of shit, but they will say the wrong thing. And the only way we know it's the wrong thing is because of what happens afterwards. Um, I, I can't give you a good example of that off the top of my head, but um if they are able to talk to the customer and not offend the customer, that's fine. But you send them to a shopping center, they should not be talking to the customers. They should have the, they should have the skills to avoid answering the, te the, the tenant's questions. And the, the tenant may love them, but that property manager is going to prefer you not do that. If you're at Joe's Bowling Alley, that may be a little different, but it's really a slippery slope. Yeah, it's safer to not, right? And and I've had I have a very specific instance where I had when I was running the service department, I had a, a specific crew for out west Texas. Uh, well, that crew wasn't there that day, so I had to send a different crew. And the different crew was bashing on the roof, telling the client that it sucked and that the installation was poor. And guess what? We installed that roof five years ago, so it it, it certainly was not a good position to be in. So no. less is more. Is the theme that I'm pulling from our conversation today, and less is more, and be accurate. Um, and, and the more you put out there, the more you have to commit to, right? So yeah, I've got two more things if I can. Number well, one, never under any circumstances tell someone they need a new roof. I don't care how horrible it is, it's a fireable offense. And I know there are owners on this call, you don't do it either. As a roof consultant, I never would tell so. There's nothing good that can come of that for you. There's a very limited number of things and they're almost all bad. Okay, so that's number one. And then number two, I also wanna point out before we run out of time that obviously I train service departments, but the other thing that I do that I wanna make sure you're all aware of is I facilitate peer groups. 
where we bring non-competing contractors together from around the country that are of similar size and similar focus. And we meet typically three times a year. And these are just phenomenal opportunities for you to get better. As I was talking to Will before we formally got started, we've we're, we've got some people that have been in these groups for seven years and they keep coming because they keep growing, they keep having new problems. They're just tremendous. So if any of you have interest in that, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. We have some openings in some groups. So. Absolutely. If, yeah. if there's any other questions, though, I'll still be glad to answer them, Will. Yeah, it looks like we're good. Um, and, and just in time too. So once again, I, I do have this recorded. I'll post it once it's done processing. But I really enjoyed this this conversation, this presentation. I appreciate you putting thought into something that you haven't done before, giving another layer, another perspective uh, to everyone. So getting a lot of good thank yous right now. Appreciate the the time. Yeah, I'd be glad to do it in the future if you'd like. Happy to. We'll set that up. Yeah, we'll set that up. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.